All right, thanks very much for that. So the way this is going to work, question and answer, this is your time. Uh, answers will come from anyone on the panel or from Keith uh, or from uh, Dave. The idea is we'll, that everyone gets an opportunity to ask a question and we'll start it from the back row and we'll come through row by row to the front. Now because of the number of people and the time we have, can you please choose your biggest question to ask? Now if someone asks your biggest question, then move to your second biggest and the third biggest and hopefully we'll get through enough, enough questions to get some piece of information that you need to have answered. After the half hour is up, we will ask people just to stand and, and go outside so we can move the chairs out of the way, because for health reasons, and then you have the opportunity to come back in and talk to anybody here on a one-to-one -one basis and ask more questions. All right, so the idea is that you'll have plenty of opportunity to talk to people specifically about your particular place it, and of course they'll do their best uh, to answer those. But in the questions here, for the sake of the video, if you can ask a question which you think will be helpful, not just for you, but for generally for understanding a piece of information, not asking questions particular to your property, which would be very difficult for someone to answer. So you can just be thinking about that, and we'll work through systematically to make sure that everyone gets an opportunity. All right? If you don't have a question, or you have a question but you don't want to ask, then just write it down and we will get that answered later on. So starting with that, Jason. Yes. Okay, I've got one question. If your house is going to be lifted, you know, like it's a full repair, um, uh, being underpinned, so it's going to be lifted and you've got a possibility of the increased vulnerability to flooding payment, how can you coordinate it so that you can get that payment and use that payment to actually lift your, your house higher so you remove some of that vulnerability? They usually start with me. Um, sorry. Yes, I'll stand up. Um, I think with a specific claim, which I'm guessing that is your claim, uh, it's probably best if we have a conversation one on one. Uh, does it? Okay, fair enough. Okay, so I guess the. The situation we have with EQC is that if there is a repair that can be done to the land, and bear in mind we're talking about land claims here, I, I can't really talk to you about dwelling claims. I'm not, I'm not confident of that content, um, and I would refer you to there or to someone else in EQC who was. But if we're talking about land claims, there needs to be an ability to produce a repair which is both feasible and consentable, first and foremost. Now if that can be done, then clearly there's a conversation that can take place to say, does that make sense? I'm assuming there's going to be an insurer involved, uh, and therefore if there's a deed of assignment in place, we're clearly going to have to work with you and the, um, the assignee of the deed, and that's where it might get a bit complicated, because if you've assigned your rights under a deed, if you've assigned your rights under a deed, clearly we talk to the insurer. If you haven't, then that's a different situation. So I think the general point would be that, but I think the specifics are going to be case by case. Um, this is quite a complex question, really good question. The first thing that will need to happen is that when you settle your claim with your private insurer, there will be a negotiation around whether or not your entitlement to your land claim is assigned to the insurer or whether or not you retain that benefit. Um, if you do not retain that benefit, then that's the end of it. Um, the view at the Residential Advisory Service is that generally payments which are paid for diminution of value bear an insufficient nexus to a house repair to justify being assigned to an insurance company. Um, in and then in terms of when you will receive it, then I would just suggest talk to EQC about that. That the EQC have a program for progressing these payments as quickly as they can, and everyone is trying to get their heads around how that is working itself out. Um, the information that's being presented tonight is, helps us understand it a little bit more, but there's still a lot more way to go 
before people are clear about how that process is going to work. So, uh, my question, I'm not going to use the microphone because I've got a loud voice and okay. it'll just be extra loud then. Um, my question for Dave Townsend is in regard to the high speed definition. Um, and I understand that the, the value that, of, that has been diminished that you're looking at is from the day before the earthquake started until you said the end of uh, 2010. Um, and it's understandable that it has taken a long time to get a formula um, made up to take allowance of all the factors. But therefore, will there be a set percentage applied to having that money for four years? Because obviously, you know, is it a reasonable amount of time to expect people to wait five years for money for something that, you know, we're all agreed that we were insured for? Our, um, the method evaluation is back as of September 2010, so no, under our method evaluation. Oh yeah, but yeah. not about the method of evaluation, but the method of payment, because therefore surely I understand the valuation being at that point and agreeing to that 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 time, but then the fact that that money has then been held for more than four years, that the interest on that money for that time should surely be taken into account. Absolutely fair question. As we have it at the moment at EQC, we're not looking to pay interest on those funds. But I'm gonna take that away because it's a fair question. One thing I would say is that the methodology to settle these claims has actually only been in place since the 29th I, I of January that. this year. That in, in my yeah. I understand that, but that's still Fair no, question, fair not. question. I'll take that away. And so the just answer is no. And Would you like not. that one as well? It's looking like we're doing a double act here, we're not. <laughs> um, generally in law, it's not automatic that interest is payable. So whether or not interest is payable is discretionary. And that applies not only to land claims, but also to house claims. So far, in the context of the residential recovery, that is a conversation that has not happened yet, but one that I would expect to happen in the future. I think the overlying thing would be a reasonable amount of time, and which is what it says in insurance policies that things are dealt with in a reasonable amount of time. I understand the complexities of it, but is the time frame reasonable? A good question. Thank you very much for that question, which Keith is going to take away. Thank you. Taking into account the, um, it's September 2010 that these valuations are, are being done from, what about all the remedial work that the council's got with, with uh, Dudley Creek and the um, diversion and the Tay Street pumping station? Now those properties in the area that all that is involved in, the valuations have dropped considerably, but they're going to come back up again when all that work is is done. Um, so the, the, these, the, the payout that we're going to get, is that, does that take that into account, the work that's going to be done? Does that take that into account? No, the valuations are pre-September um, 2010, so there wasn't that issue then. Well, what, there was still a, a knowledge of the susceptibility of the overall area, but not the focused knowledge that's occurred since. Now our valuations are back then, um, assuming that normal course of events, you know, normal things are being fixed. Right. It's worth noting that uh, some of the some of the properties in the Dudley Creek catchment, the extra flooding is due to changes in the catchment and not changes on the property. So a large amount of the, the flooding up there is due to changes up in the network within that catchment, and that's the, that's the change that the council is addressing, and that is outside of the scope of the increased flooding vulnerability payment. So, um, I, I mean, a part of your question is really around double dipping, and th th that is not so in, in the W Creek catchment. So they're considered off-site influences then, 
Exactly. Yes. yes. Off-site influences. So, for instance, uh, with you, where you've got properties that um, are downstream from the Flockton Basin, that, but say on Dudley Creek, say Stapleton's Road, that would be considered off-site influence. Uh, I, I don't know about the specifics of each individual property, but well, I understand no, it's that not, it, it not is... an individual property. It's any property that's downstream from Flockton that is affected by flooding now. Is that considered off-site, or is that is that all considered part of the earthquake? Because um, a lot of that land has dropped um, relative to sea level about 400 millimetres. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll defer that question to Matt because he's, okay. he's got the understanding of where the land has dropped. Yeah, and also move towards the creek, a lot of those properties. Well, I'll try to answer it if I can. <laughs> um, so you, you're talking about land dropping and yes. then the flood depth increasing. Yes. So if that, if that has occurred on a specific property, then you will be within, the, uh, within this, this study in terms of right. being considered for increased flooding vulnerability. Yes. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, hello. I've just got a question just related to the DOV calculation. Um, it's based on September 2010 valuations. And the example that you gave on, on a house had a valuation of 200K, um, resulting in a DOV of about um, 17,000 or so. Why is there no indexing of that amount to reflect the general change in property valuations in the Christchurch market in the last five years? And is that not then applying a valuation and a compensation based on something that happened five years ago, shortchanging what the actual compensation is? I think that's the same question that was asked before. No, it's a different question. His question was related to interest. Mine's related to indexing of the of the uh, DOV calculation to reflect the change in property mar market values in Christchurch in general over the last five years. You mean the increase in property values? Correct. Yeah. No, that's not part of the the formula. That's Why not? that. Why not? It's, well, it's, it's outside the impact on that property at the time as a result of the earthquake. Yeah, but, but we're getting. But we're waiting five years for for the uh, compensation to come through. So why is it not being indexed to reflect the period of time that we've had to wait? I, I see that as exactly the same question as before about the interest on outstanding. That's a different question too. That is that's a different question. Well, in that case, I haven't got an answer for that. Well, why not? Who made the decision? What's that? 2000, because, because after the events, we went through that period where there's a strong stigma and the prices are right down. There was no market operating in Canterbury for six months. Of, of, we've got evidence of properties going to market, nobody in the room and selling very cheaply. And then, so it was better to have a stable market where we've got the evidence back as it, the day before the earthquake. Better for the assessment of it, the clarity, Okay, so can we just can we just keep this another good question. So Keith, we you're capturing that question. So I, I also hear that as a different question. Well, I would suggest that someone take that back to the power of the decision makers and actually review it. I think it's a fair question, and that's that's what we will do. Uh, I wouldn't go as far as saying it's not accurately compensating. I, I think there will be different views. Of course, there will. Um, EQC's overall objective here is to have an assessment process which is fair, transparent, and is reviewable. Now, everything we're talking about this evening is potentially reviewable. Of course, it is. Um, but I'm not going to step into the legal space, um, indexation of claims, you know, it's likely that most of these claims did occur on the 4th of September 2010, so that's the point at which we make the assessment of uh, the quantum. Now how that's brought forward, I'll take away. Thanks for that, so just coming forward. 
So, Sue, can you, can you, do you mind just waiting in, just coming forward a bit of time? I know you've just entered, so, excuse me. Uh, it's mainly for Keith. We talked uh, before about, uh, I'm from the Clopton area. We've already discussed uh, the um, uh, pooling of water, and particularly on property in our basin. But uh, most of these properties have all been inspected by EQC. They've done and got away with assessment. Where properties have actually been pooled or flooded, should we all have received an IFD feedback from UQC? So I just need to clarify. So all of the properties that we've assessed in Canterbury, yeah. so including all of Christchurch and therefore yeah. Yeah. Flocks and Basin, we wrote to about 10,000 people, yeah. and, and that's round numbers uh, last year. And that would have included a significant number of properties in Flockton. We then, um, as we agreed we would do, uh, carried out some area-wide reviews after those individual assessments to try to ensure that we hadn't missed properties, uh, to also try and ensure that we uh, were consistent across areas. Uh, but what we also did was look at increased frequency flooding um, data as well. Uh, now, there were a number of properties that came through that second review. Um, I think all of those were written to at the time, but there may be some properties which are still potentially vulnerable who haven't had a letter. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is that... Uh, we okay. could be. Uh, can, can we take your details and I'll check for you? Right, right thank you. Um, just inquiring about a, a street in the Flockton Basin that was uh, Carrick Street that was flooded quite a lot. Um, there's a house in Carrick Street for sale that hasn't sold, and I suspect if I wanted to sell my house, I might have to give it away. Now I'm <laughs> just eight percent isn't going to do it. So what about? It seems to me you have to have a street by street because some streets are just have have gone down more than eight percent than the, your matrix. Your matrix doesn't take into account streets which are seriously, seriously, seriously flooded. The 8%, can, yeah, I mean, it, the percentage varies according to how far, the, well, with the impact on the individual property and how far that property is dropped. But what if a house is like dropped 50% in value because of the flooding? I think um, I think the properties in our street would have well, dropped by fifty yeah, percent. No, no, no doubt. I believe that there's this very strong stigma there at the moment with that Flockton Basin over it from a value perspective. Yes, but the, the, you'll find that the market is re-entering. People are re-entering, purchasing in that area now. Uh, as I said, there's a property for sale. It's been to auction. It hasn't sold. I don't think the stigma is very, very there, and I can't see it going for a very long time. Personally, it'll be more than seven years. Yes, sir. Sorry, I've got so many questions, I don't know where to start. And I'm, if they don't come out quite right, please forgive me. Um, I, I, I live in Carrick Street as well and um, been there for 25 years and my house has been flooding too. So Tonkin and Taylor came and they talked to me and they told me that I was not at increased flooding vulnerability because previously I was in a one in 100 year flood zone and I'm still in a one in 100 year flood zone. So I'm really confused about what actually triggers me to be come in, at increased flood flooding. Is it I've dropped 500, 500 millimetres, does that help? I've flooded seven times since the earthquake, twice inside the house, is that? I don't, I don't understand what it is that would make me, and I'm still not an increased flooding vulnerable as far as I know. But you, sir, you, you talked about 50, one in 50 year, one in 10 year, taking that into consideration. The Tonkin and Taylor, they won't take that into consideration. It's just this one in 100 year thing which is even written down here. So I was, I was probably one in 50 before, now I'm one in 10, but according to, according to this gentleman, I'm, right. I yeah. haven't increased. Our, 
our overall assessments were based on the 1 in 100. We then looked at the, the change in frequency as an addition. But there are certain criteria that the property to get onto the eye if the list had to meet. Um, So, um, Carrick Street in that part of Blockton is quite a complex area, hydraulic as Helen alluded to earlier as well. Um, we know we've had a lot of ground settlement in that area, that's not disputed at all. Um, what we've found generally from our modelling is that there has been, in some parts of the, the area, an increase in, in flood depth based on our modelling. In other areas, the flood water depth has actually, as we've modelled it, has gone down with the land to a certain degree, so the, um, the levels haven't increased as much as the land has dropped. So, you know, it's a, it's, it's a bathtub effect basically, so if you put the same amount of water in, uh, in, a, in a confined area, then the, um, the, flood, you know, the level's not going to increase unless you add more water to it. Um, so if you've got the same amount of water going into a bath, and then you, you make the bath deeper, Unless you could add more water, the bath's not the water in the bath isn't going to get any deeper. Is what I'm trying to say. Probably not in the greatest way. Um, but in answer to your frequency question, um, taking on board comments from yourself and others, we have actually gone back, as Keith said, and, and looked at the more frequent flooding events for, for, for that area and well, across the city, but particularly that area. Um, and we have actually identified a number of properties which we believe would, would come into the, uh, the assessment process as a result of that. So I, I can't comment on your specific property right now, but I can talk to you afterwards and you can take some details and find out what's going on there if you like. Thanks, Matt. Let's say un under the, the regime we're rolling at the moment, we haven't looked at those. We're just going on our ones and we'll address them when they're in the SGNT. Why isn't it you Only after it's passed the first steps to get into the IFV category. Yeah, well they won't do that because they set the threshold here. And that's it, isn't it? It's just the same as you've set a threshold of 2010. Who, who made this decision? Why, why, so, why is it one, in one of the reasons it's one in a hundred years is because that's a more severe flood. And it was kind of at the time we thought that, you know, if you have a more severe flood, then you're going to bring more people into the process overall in, in, in a more equitable way because if you've got a 10 year flood you're going to have less flooding across the city so you're going to have when you're assessing that change you're going to be looking at less properties to start with now it's not a perfect process we've been learning as we've been going along so we've been taking on board things like this that you're saying you're now more frequently flooded than you were before so that's been incorporated back into the process we're not quite at the end of that process so as i said it's 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 a learning process for everybody, really. Great, thank I think that's a good... So I think you should have a chat to him. Yes, and, and it is a review process, is what I've heard. It's a, it's a process which is still being reviewed, still open to very good questions which are coming up tonight. And I said afterwards, you can talk one-on-one. -on -one. So thanks, sir. Ma'am. Um, I think my question is, is probably the same. I jotted down, and it's for the valuation, Dave. So... I wrote down here when you explain your DOV that what you're, I assume that the change in land subsidence effectively um, is you're assuming that you're taking that as a almost a perfect proxy for diminu diminution of value, right? So you said you're taking what the land has changed per the Tonkin and Taylor report plus a number of other factors right and then you're saying that that is a proxy for the valuation drop is that is my understanding not correct? so much the valuation drop but the maximum height of the flood that we can take into account the rest would be if the flood's higher would be offside influences okay i found it very difficult with our property which is parallel to carrick street it has flood above floor level five times and it's basically uninhabitable and I can't imagine anybody buying it. Um, 
Now, what I want to know, and I think what these people want to know, is you've got a methodology, I can understand it, it seems reasonable for probably 80% of properties, we apply the 80-20 rule. Now, what's always confused me in this process here, we could have done this five years ago, or four years ago, whatever, for 80% of people, 20%, you know, the 80-20 rule, 20% are outliers, including my property, his property, my parents are just about dead over this, it's their property. Um, so, we clearly, the changed level of the property, which I understand to be about half a metre, but I can't get that information from anywhere to dis distinguish between what is consequential or off-site and what is actual land, because it's obtuse to me, I don't get it. So are we going to get that in your pack that you send out and we're going to be able to understand it and come back to you to discuss it? You won't get it in the initial pack but on review, if you right. ask it to review it, you'll get it then. So the initial course. pack itself will have the initial pack itself will have quite a few pages in it, and the we can talk to Cat. Would you like to mention here? No. Sorry, no. So no. Because um, that's the information that we desperately need. That's what I've been asking for for four years to understand. Okay, and so, we can't get it. And okay, so to your, to your point about the 80-20 rule, and I think that's absolutely a fair comment, um, what we're sending out to people, and, and let's say we are sending it out to the 80%, um, the pack is about that thick already. Um, and what's in there, there's a four-page letter which helps, I hope, helps people understand what else they're receiving. About the third line in it says we're going to call you, so we're not encouraging people to have to read through everything if they don't wish to. So they have an ability to then have a, a conversation over the phone to talk through the detail. There's an engineering pack which is prepared by Tonkin and Taylor, which does give flood maps for the property. It shows exacerbated flood depth changes, to your point, and it shows, therefore, the engineering assessment that leads to our belief that there is a DOV uh, claim payment in here. There's some information from valuers on their registered valuer letterhead, which will explain how the DOV figure is calculated. Uh, there's a summary sheet which will also talk to visible land damage if there is still a visible land damage claim to be paid. So people will see well, this is the total we're talking about for your property. Now I make one caveat which is we've still got increased liquefaction vulnerability claims to deal with. I'll keep going if I may. There's a DOV fact sheet which will talk you through on a single page what Dave has explained this evening. And there's an updated increased flooding vulnerability fact sheet and I think We've got copies of those here, um, which hopefully gives people more clarity. Now, our sense is all of that to everybody is a lot of information to assimilate. The two pages that Dave talked about, which you saw on screen, I'm gonna take away from here. There may well be uh, a population amongst our claimants who want that automatically. And if they do, then we'll work out if we can do that sensibly so that we don't bombard everybody. That's just another two pages, but as, but as Dave said, there's... No, but you'll probably need to read through about seven or eight pages of explanation as to how those spreadsheets work. Absolutely, and I'm not... And that's fine. And I'm, And, and I'm okay. So I've taken that. Absolutely. So I've taken that. I, I think we will review whether we send that out automatically to everybody. I, I get absolutely what you guys are saying here. And if you want more, Um, right, so can I just note something? Oh, Thank you. I mean, I think that we've had a very clear point made and a very clear show of hands about the strength of feeling about this particular point that you've raised. Keith has acknowledged that he has heard that point uh, and we have captured it and we will be following that up. Okay? So thanks for that question. Thanks.
feasibility and consentability. What's the uh, criteria for this? So for EQC to settle a claim on the basis of the cost of a repair, so EQC is not going to repair land, we're, we're not going to do what's happened with dwellings, so settlement will be based on either the cost of a repair, and if not feasible or consentable, then we go to DOB, yeah? So you're saying, so what is what's, feasible what's and consentable? Of, of what's the criteria So the repair has to be able to be completed legally, um, so legally means it has to be consentable, which is a question I think for Helen, um, and I'm pleased we've got Helen here, um, because that's, that's a challenge. After all, lots of properties being raised by varying amounts throughout Christchurch is going to cause some subsequent issues. Considering that um, EQC is paying cash out on this, and the bank there is saying that they'll apply this money to their mortgage rather than perhaps remediate the land, uh, I think the criteria for that also needs to be disclosed because how can how, if, if, if those people are not going to be given the opportunity to remediate their land rather than have that um, and get the equity back in their property for resale value rather than the bank take the money they're not being given that opportunity to use that money uh, you said it is the last bit that they would be given that opportunity perhaps to have a talk with the bank the bank things seem to think that they've got the ultimate right to that money, then in fact the money was actually going to do that. And the criteria is, who says it's not consentable? There's a big question there, and using those words, feasible and consentable. Not feasible, not consentable. Put against the mortgage, loss of equity for those people, not being able to remediate their land, to get their value back. Including the value, so that includes all of you, which is, is lowering the equity and value of that property. So one is, what can EQC do under the terms of the EQC Act in terms of how we can respond to this damage? Um, and that is that we can pay the cost of a feasible or consentable repair. Now what is a consentable repair? I'm going to look at Helen and say that's a council decision, that's not an EQC decision. Yes. Yeah. So, so if we've got it wrong and there is a sorry. Okay. So the the simplest example of of a repair that is not consentable is if a property has dropped by five hundred meters and maybe a whole street has um, by five hundred millimeters. Uh, that that land could simply be filled to that level of 500 millimetres. Now that is unlikely to be consentable uh, under the district plan because what that would do would be deflect stormwater to your neighbours and you're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to deflect a flooding problem on your property and put that flooding problem on your neighbours. So um, you have to find some other way of, of raising your house. Uh, but so you know, even even under, I mean, you may want to comment on this as well. You're, you're not allowed to. You're not allowed to transfer a hazard. Uh, no, very happy to consent something that fixes the land, but not when it deflects that hazard onto your neighbours. And I think that's a, a principle in law. You may want to comment on that. It, there's, a, there's a number of situations like that. It's different if you want to raise the house and you can raise the house on the um, existing foundations. And in the new district plan, one of the things we're addressing is where that then um, sort of breaks into the sunlight claims for your neighbours and you'll get an exemption if you're meeting the floor level requirements for raising your house. Sorry, I was trying to address different, different ways of addressing it.
That's right. So I, I was just trying to give you an example of one that might not be consentable. Can I just answer the question about um, uh, the bank's involvement? So if the customer's intention is to reinstate the value of the property and use that money, the bank will be really comfortable with that because that's the key. Well, in terms of the bank having a... Um, yeah. So in terms of the process, the, the funds, in terms of the settlement, if there is a mortgage, it will actually go to the bank. The bank will then contact the customer, find out what their intention is with the funds, and then uh, work through case by case with each individual. But again, if the, um, if the customer's intention is to reinstate the, the value of the property, uh, the bank will be more than comfortable with that. So it's not withholding. <laughs> This issue is a really critical one, but what the best guidance that we have came from the High Court and the declaratory judgment. And what the court said is that the first thing that you should try to do is to settle a claim based on the cost of repair. But they also said that where it's not feasible to carry out the repair or where the cost of repair is excessive or disproportionate so that a reasonable person would not carry out the repair, then it is legitimate to settle on the basis of DOB. So that's what the court said. Now, I know that you all want much more information than that and much more specific criteria than that, but at this stage, none is available. But the other thing is that the court said, if you dispute what EQC did, or their decision, then you can bring a claim to the district court. If that is something that is in dispute and you cannot resolve it with EQC through discussion or through their review process, then going to court is one option. So again, I think we're talking about your claim. We're not talking about your claim. All right, okay. So I think the best advice here would be to, okay. So for individuals who've got this situation, you know, we are open to review. So if a, if a customer can bring a feasible or consentable repair to EQC on a property where we don't believe that's possible, we will review it, not a problem. So the, um, that Flockton Basin area was not mapped as a flood management area in the previous district plan, so uh, those those fill rules were not were not applicable then. Question here. Yep. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's in regards to the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement. It has been identified that uh, Sarah did not 
you know, fulfill the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement when they made the zoning decisions. It was uh, decided it was desirable to use the structures within the city council and use the district plan for that sort of second phase of the red zoning decisions. Uh, we are now seeing uh, the district plan coming out here and it identifies very large areas which are basically you know, not, not buildable. And some of these areas are behind temporary stock banks, which are not up to standard. Uh, the Insurance Council has made a, a press release and a, a statement to the Prime Minister office that uh, buildings should not be, it is not recommended in these high risk areas. This is practically uh, red zoning you know, some uh, of the coastal areas which should have been done by Sierra in my opinion. But um, it brings me to uh, a breakfast uh, seminar held by Sierra, 7th of June last year, where EQC identified that there were 2,000 properties that wouldn't have any land remediation. There were no solutions available, probably because of uh, totally lost ground bearing and uh, uneconomical to repair. Uh, a part of that was also uh, f another 1,500 properties which were uh, subject to these uh, stone columns and these sort of uh, land remediations which I, I've, I've heard about and you know, seen some uh, illustrations but I haven't seen in practice. Yeah. But, you know, uh, my question is, you know, this, these are 3,500 properties. Are these properties in the coastal area, which, you know, uh, apply to the high-risk area? And how is EQC going to handle these claims? There are no solutions. So I think we are talking about ILB here, not IFV. Is that fair? It's basically unbuildable land, you know, okay. uneconomic to, no. to repair. We don't have the luxury of anyone, I think, in the room from Sarah. And I think it would be totally inappropriate for me to talk on behalf of decisions that Sarah have made about zoning and properties. I think EQC has an obligation under its act to respond to damage which is defined under its act. Uh, so for ILB damage, um, what needs to occur is material physical damage and a loss of amenity resulting in a loss of value. That, that's what we respond to. Now, if we've got situations which are determined by Sarah or by central government or by council, we can only respond. We, we can't drive those decisions as we've discussed before, Hugo. Um, I think this is a wider conversation than this room, frankly. And yeah. I suggest we take it offline. Okay, we'll do. Thank you. All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all. Sorry, just one more last question. And gentlemen, back. But we have, can I just say that we're actually way over time. Uh, there are people who do want to put questions, which we will have here and there. But if you want to just excuse yourself because uh, you don't want to be rude, just take a few seconds, you could do that now if you wish, because I know it's gone past time and some people may have other appointments. If that's okay, we can still record these questions here. So just 30 seconds for those who need to do something else. Please take that time. I don't know who, who can answer this, but uh, what about lateral spreading and cross thinning? When, uh, the land has lost its bearings and uh, yeah, basically can't hold any foundations or a house. Is that the depth? Is that the earthquake damage? So we can not get any answers about that? If, uh, well, there's, there's a separate process in place for, for LB, which is, Keith said is still ongoing. One, one quick question for you, Tonkin Taylor. Can, um, can one property stay put when a huge 
lateral movement happens? Uh, it will depend entirely on the, the location of that property. If it's very close to the river, can it stay put when everything around it well, again, moves? We're getting, we're getting into specifics. If you want to talk about a specific example, I can, I can talk. To Is that, that scientifically possible? There's a lot of things that are scientifically possible, whether they're likely to happen or not is another question entirely. Sorry, but uh, the reason I'm asking is I know of a property that hasn't moved on, on, on uh, the lighter from Tonkin and Taylor, but it ha has still moved over a meter so when it's surveyed. It's, uh, um, it's very um, happy to, to talk to, to you specifically about that. So, gentlemen, it's back. Thanks, Jason. G'day, I'm sorry I arrived a bit late, so I probably missed a lot of information, but I came for questions anyway. I'm Can you a, just hold the mic up? Yeah, I'm a property financier by trade, and I finance developers and builders and a lot in St Albans and, and this area. Now, raising money for these properties is nearby impossible. I have stacks of clients coming to me all the time. All property funders aren't interested in TC Freeland due to the cost, or any development just costs too much money, including my property. I've actually had the land price to lift it up 600 mils at 800 a square metre and I've got 1,250 square metres. Now, that's a lot of, it's close enough to 7, 800 grand. The property's only valued at 570. I'm guessing your offer probably won't even hit 100. And so what am I to do? And just to answer the lady's question earlier on over this side regarding um, the, the value, I think you said that property values are creeping back up. I know four properties within 300 metres of my property that have sold for probably about 30% of their GV in 2010 due to the cost to obviously reinstate them. Yeah. So in answer to your question about your property, um, the cost of repair you've outlined, so I would suggest that's not feasible to talk to John's point about is that reasonable in terms of the cost of that and is that what a reasonable person would do. I would suggest without insurance you probably wouldn't do that. Um, from an EQC viewpoint, we have a number of caps on that type of claim, so the minimum lot size value of that property would be the absolute cap in any event, which I'm guessing would be significantly lower than the figure anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is a, there's a contractual response, but there's also, I think, uh, what, what would the intent be? Um, and if you want to have a conversation about that separately, again, I'm more than happy to talk to you about it. Um, sorry, the second question was? Um, in regards to the value exchange, because we've been held to ransom for five years, we haven't been able to get back into the market, and prices have definitely crept up per square metre rate around the city. I know for a fact, that's what I do for a living, I finance people into it. Um, we, we, if we we're getting money back in 2010, and it's a very different price point to go back out to the market. And so I just think you can't hold us at 2010 prices without capturing the markets today because that's the market we have to re-enter yeah that was the same as the interest question before yeah i'm not actually talking about interest i'm talking about current market pricing we've got to enter today's market that we're being offered 2010's pricing i think we didn't the, have that separate question. yeah, yeah. We didn't have that. well I, I was struggling with that now but but i can see that there are some issues with with your proposal because these properties have moved beyond where they were, the value has increased on them, and therefore that is a betterment. Would, would we say it's a betterment from where our initial assessment was? No, what it is, it's a percentage on the total value of the property. And that percentage grows as, as the, the, of the loss grows as the property yeah. grows in value. Okay. I know that yeah, I can, I can see, yeah, so you're talking about indexing it to the, the market movement yeah. today, yeah. That, that DOB, yeah. whereas somebody over here wanted the interest payment because of having me pay. Yeah. yeah, that's why I said I thought that diff slightly different answers, but the same. Yeah. I'm talking just index two. No, no, I, I didn't hear the start of yours, I thought, and I thought yours was IL. No, mine's just general market value of land. It doesn't matter which title we should put it under. It's just the end of the day, prior to the quakes. So, thank you very much, sir. So, I mean, that question, both of those questions have been received by Keith. He has made a note of both of those questions, and I see them as different, so we'll be following it up.
Yeah. Well, can we? I think he needs some time to go and talk to his people about that if he's just taking that on board properly. Can I give them when we've got the answer in a form that I'm comfortable with that I can explain to you. And I don't know how long that's going to take because I haven't actually asked. I think there are a number of points in here that need to be considered properly. Now, if you want me to make rush decisions, fair enough, but I think you probably want a proper decision. Um, what I'd like to do is give you my contact details and you can answer these questions because you're saying you're going to take them away. So then we can see a result at the end as opposed to um, saying that we'll look into it and include it into future things. I'd like an answer. Yeah, so these questions are going to be taken from all of you this evening and from lunchtime today and from subsequent seminars. They're all going to get answered. Um, and we're not going to hide them away, because why would we do that? that there is no value in having these sessions. Sorry? All right, so I'm, I'm going to sit here, and you can take this not as a personal offence either. I've worked for EQC for eight months. My biggest challenge was, did I take the job in the first place? Because I had to inherit all the things that you're frustrated by. Now, I took it on, and I took it on in good faith. And if I say to you, I will get you an answer, I'll get you an answer. And if I don't, come and find me. I haven't said that to you before, so I've never met you. No, but uh, you can understand that there is a little bit of distrust in why I would want an actual answer and why I would like to give you the contact. I fully understand that. All I can do is offer to move forward. I can't rewrite history for you. No, but you can offer to, uh, to say, yes, you will. That's what I just said. So uh, I uh, certainly have heard the frustration in the room. I'm sure Keith has heard uh, similar frustrations before. We live in. Yep. We hear it. We live it. Yes. We don't work at We live it. This is a time where we've actually run over time. Is it, there is opportunity for you to talk one-on-one -on -one with anybody here. But for us to set that up, we actually need to move the chairs out of here so that we don't have a health problem. And then you can more than welcome to come back and talk one-on-one. -on -one. So, can we just ask you to move out and then come back in? Thank you.